Okay. We've got the recorded starting. So, ladies and gents, welcome to night whatever of the Security Plus Boot Camp. I'm your host, Andrew Staten, for the night. And for those of you guys that are watching the recording after the fact, class is live from the Cyber Protect Training Center and not the parking lot. You know, I mean, look, it's either called I I own the goof, you guys give me grief for it. And and I know I know this. I know I know Ben will give me grief about it as long as it's funny. And it's all it's all in love. It's all in good fun and good jest. But so we're gonna start off here with a little bit of review. So I'm gonna ask you guys to, if you can, get a piece of paper or pull up a notepad. So we've been encouraging you guys to study ports and protocols and have those memorized. So we're going to test that a bit tonight. And I'm going to be jumping back and forth between, between the port, between the protocol, and we're going to see what you guys remember. So I want you guys to keep notes, and then we'll walk, we'll walk through the answers at the end. If we don't have time to get through them all, we'll, you know, I'm going to ask you guys to be honest, grade yourselves and figure out where you're struggling. So I'm gonna give you guys a minute roughly for each port. Actually, no, minute's probably a little too generous. Minute's a little too generous. Let's, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna push you guys. We're gonna go anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds or however long I think's long enough. Yeah, so starting off, I want you guys, I'll put this in chat. What's port 69? Feel free to chat it. Um, the biggest thing here is we're wanting to check for retention. So if you write it down, find that that helps with memorization. You go back, you make an X going, I missed this. All right. Next one. What port does Telnet operate on? It went to me. You know, if if you you're struggling. With which bed to send it to, just take a guess. You've got a 50 50. All right. Next one. What's on port 88? And you know what? It just hit 610, so let's throw another one. What port does LDAP operate on? Look, I'm hoping to throw them quicker at you guys, and you guys can Google the answer. You know, you know what? You, got, you gave me a little more than what I wanted there. So you know what? In addition to LDAP, I want you guys to give me LDAX. LDAX or LDAP over TLS. Let's go ahead, because someone decided to jump ahead a bit. Actually, I, I'm not going to give you grief on that. That was good. You anticipated the next move. Um, well, you had it right initially. Um, that answer is just plain wrong. Nope. 
And you know what? We're going to give you guys a, a, a soft toss here. So I'm going to hit you guys with a double whammy here. What ports do HTTP and HTTPS go over respectively? You know, I really appreciate the dot, dot, dot. Does that give me the time for Dr. Google? I mean, well, it's not 44. There you go. And you know what? If you guys thought two ports was bad, why don't you guys give me all the ports for net bias? Well, you know what? You guys answered that one really quick. So let's throw another one here. What's on port 67 and 68? I mean, you guys are getting that one. Let's let's see what what can I throw here? What's on five one four? John, Shane, you guys got it. Kincaid and Trenton, you guys are on it. I mean, you know, it, either you guys are really doing well or Dr. Google's running on overdrive tonight. You know what? As you guys did that one. What's on ports 161 and 162? You know what? We're going to give you guys another soft toss here. What's on port 22? We'll give another, I don't know. Another five seconds. So I'm going to hit you guys with another set of doubles here. What ports do my SQL and MS? What ports do my SQL and MS SQL run over? Okay. You guys are getting it. 
Next one. What's on port 119? All right, you guys are getting that. What about SMTP? Now you guys got that? I want you guys to give me FTP. So how do you guys feel with the ports? How do you feel you guys did? Okay. Well, I'm hoping you guys were taking notes because there are five protocols missing that we have not gone over. And, you know, I, I feel like being a little generous, so I'm going to give you guys a whole minute to figure that out. John, you've got three of the five. Let me, let me see. All right, so the five we're missing, I'm gonna go ahead and drop it in chat. I'm gonna give you guys the answer for those five. Um, we didn't cover RDP or remote desktop. We didn't cover POP. We didn't cover NTP, IMAP, or DNS. So I want you guys to do for those of you guys that hand wrote, circle ones that you felt a little iffy about, and encourage you to go back and map match that out within the handout and slides. You have a list of all the ports and protocols. I want you to highlight and identify which ones you missed. And if you haven't already, make a flashcard for it. So I'm going to pull here and make sure that I've got this correctly. So that way. Given you guys. Interesting thing here. So, you guys have any questions about that? Yes. Um, you can. I don't recall from anything I've seen on the test that. You know, most times the thing list IMAP, they're going to list version four. But for sake of knowing the port, if you know IMAP, yeah, the port number doesn't change regardless of version. Yep. So next up here, we're going to see who of you guys did or took good notes or reviewed the slides. We introduced a fun little exercise that we call the crypto bucket, where we had acronyms based off to help you remember your cryptography. So 
you know, I, I'm, I'm going to chime in to Ben here and, and going to ask, should we, should I throw them out at cold turkey or should I give them the acronym? I would definitely give them the acronym. Okay. Ben, you are a lot nicer than I was going to be. So we did. You know, that, that is a fair point. Let me, let me defer over here and make sure I've got my notes right. And, and you know what? While I'm, while I'm processing that, I'm going to throw a question at you guys for some review. What are the three types of controls we talked about last week? And I want each of you to private message me in chat an example for each of those three. Kincaid, right on. Josh, you got it. Here. You know, I didn't didn't think this would be too tough. Yep. So what are the three types of controls we talked about last week that you implement for security? So, you know what? Let, let's do a quick review. So, the three types of controls you need to know. The categories you have administrative, you have physical, and you have technical. Administrative, that's something that's set by upper management or leadership within a company. So, it's going to be acceptable use policy for when you're issued a company asset, what you can do and not do on that device. It's going to be setting, you know, hey, we're going to go through a set of interviews to onboard you. We're going to have an exit interview for you when you off board. So it's something that it's, it's set up. And one of the ways I remember that, it's something that's a little more legal. So, you know, acceptable use policy is a perfect example of that. You're talking about a physical control. It's something that you can touch. So it's going to be cable locks. It's going to be setting up a man trap to where you're delaying someone. Or even, you know, I would count putting a speed bump. That's a physical control if you're seeking to have someone come on site. It's going to slow them down. So physical control, it's a security control you can touch. And a technical control, it's anything to do with computer policy. So it's setting password expiration dates requiring complexity. It's setting up account lockout policies that after you screw up your password three times, you have to wait to try to attempt again. It's technical controls. It's something that is pushed out 
either using group policy and it's something that you configure on a machine to increase its security posture. Does that make sense? Okay. I mean, you know, it, it's been a long week. I mean, I mean, it's it's just Tuesday. Okay. So you know, let's let's think through a little little interesting. Do you guys remember what we called the? What we refer to the model that's shaped like an onion, to where you know when you get past one layer of security, you have another one. Do you guys remember what that's called? Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Okay. So. Uh, I've delayed the inevitable, inevitable here. So I'm going to give you guys an acronym for the cryptography algorithms we talked about last week. And I want you guys to write or message me in chat with what that acronym is short for. So first one here, I'm going to start off with asymmetric algorithms. And the acronym we use to remember it is DARE. What are our asymmetric algorithms? All right, you guys, those you guys that have messaged me so far are doing real good with it. So we're going to give just another few seconds for anyone who's still thinking or, you know, looking up in the slides or flipping notes to find the answer. So the algorithms that you know help with the mnemonic Derek, you've got Diffie-Hellman, you've got ECC, RSA, El Gamo, and Knapsack. So I'm going to encourage you guys to write out that mnemonic and the others that we're about to go through. Because within the test environment, knowing these mnemonics, it's going to help you more than you think. So the next one we're going to toss at you guys is symmetric. And the mnemonic is 23 brains. John, you are on it, my man. Yeah, I mean, you either were able to anticipate the question, or, you know, he, you took a look. Now, I'm not going to complain. I dig the move, but...
You've got it, Kincaid. Give just another few seconds. For someone to answer or take a shot. I mean, you know, Ben, I almost feel like I did need to give him the acronym. I mean, how quickly a few of these guys answered. Seems like they've been preparing. I mean, either that or I'm just predictable. So, let me give you guys this. So, the correct answer, two fish, triple deaths, blowfish, RC4, slash five, AES, idea, guess, safer. Those are your symmetric algorithms. Now, you guys probably remember the acronym for hash. Because it's really not my, and, and Ben's not out here for me to censor my censor. So, but you know, it's really not my shit. Look, Ben, you wrote, you made the slides. I mean. So. Okay, Josh, you guys have it. I mean. You guys must be taking copious amounts of notes. Either that or it's almost like Kincaid's heard it a time or two. It, it's, it's a mnemonic that we've used here for just, you'll hear it in just about any of our boot camps. I believe it did. Uh, I'm, I won't. I will not speak for Ben, but I'm pretty certain that's something we came up with. The hashing, yes, we came up with that. Ben, ben says that for the hashing, we came up with that. I mean, look, it's a good mnemonic. So we'll give a couple, a few more seconds for anyone that wants to jump in here last minute. And the answer, you know, hashing really isn't my shit. But with it, you know, you need to remember RIPEMD, NTLM, MD5, SHA, with that mnemonic, the, you know, after we get through HAVAL and HMAC, the exclamation points a throwaway and last and ends with tiger. So encourage you guys, write this down, make flashcards. Because we will throw this at you again. And I don't know, you know, I don't know about Ben, but I may not be as be nice enough to give you guys the acronym. Do we have, have any questions about anything we've done here in review? So what we're going to do, tonight we begin domain three, which let me go ahead and get slide going. And let's go ahead and share screen. So domain three 
with the latest CompTIA 601 exam. This is a new domain for this exam and its implementation. And it's 25% of the test. Having looked at the exam objectives compared to the previous exam, what CompTIA has done here is they've combined two domains from the previous exam objectives and consolidated them into one area. So implementation, it's going to really cover how you deal with implementing secure technologies and implementing new technologies into a enterprise scheme or network. And as part of this domain, it comes into a little bit of devices, what things are and aren't. And for some of you guys that have been in, you know, worked in industry or have taken, you know, an IT course before, some of this is going to be a review for you. But for some of you guys, if this is your first exposure, this might be some brand new information. So I encourage you guys to ask questions and, you know, I recognize I talk too fast. So. If you guys need me to slow down, I won't be offended. So here we've got, got a listing of some of the devices that you might see on your exam. And we'll go into in depth with all of these. And you know, I'm not going to read off the list here. Um, we do have a fancy little piece of artwork with that like brick wall and some eyes peering through it. I mean, I mean, it that looks kind of sus, not even going to lie. So the first device we're going to talk about is a hub. Now, the one thing I always think when I think of hubs is that they're dumb. They're just a physical device. So any data that is sent into that hub is going to be sent to everyone connected to it. So when it comes to networking, you have what's called a collision domain, which is where, you know, really impacts what devices can send data at a time or how many can send it, you know, simultaneously. So a collision occurs whenever network is transmitted at the same time and the device isn't able to separate out that network traffic. So a hub, it's a multi-port device. It's, you know, whenever I think of it, it's a small box about like about yay big. It's got four ports on it. And it collects, connect, all those devices are in a single collision domain. Meaning if you know, two devices send something at send data at the same time, you're going to have a collision. So traffic on a hub, it's sent out to all the devices on that hub. And a hub operates at layer one of the OSI model. It's a physical device. It just gets signals in and it pushes signals out. So an analogy that it's used here is that, I mean, let me go back. So, you know, if networks in, in bed, I'm trying to remember the visual here, so correct me if I'm wrong. So if you were to think about networks as a traffic intersection, you know, a hub would be an intersection where you've got a stop sign. You know, you got a four-way stop, but people may stop, they may not, they may blow right through. Actually, that analogy doesn't work, so I'm going to jettison it because I can't remember the rest of it. So I'll need to doctor the recording if possible. But so a switch is an upgrade from a hub. It's able to think a bit. So with it, it has the ability that it's able to separate that network to allow nodes to communicate through broadcasts. So it's able, you know, rather than me shouting at the entire room here, you know, if I were operating like a switch, you know, I could just talk softer and just say what I need to say to Kelsey or communicate to Shane or Trenton what I needed to say without everyone else knowing. Each port on the switch has its own broadcast domain, meaning that it's able to send data. And with switching, you have the, app, you have the ability for media access control. 
where you're able, based on the MAC address of a device, you're able to allow traffic to go through or not go through. This is where you begin to see some access lists and policy occur. And a switch, it operates on layer two of the OSI model or at the data link layer. So, you know, as we've looked at the upgrade, you know, a switch, it passes data to all the devices connected to it. A switch, it's able to discern who it needs to send data to and who not send it to. And then a router, a router is used to get between networks. So, real, most times you see a router, it's used to connect a local area network, so an office or a home, to a wide area network or a WAN. And routers, they operate at layer three of the OSI model. And you're able to configure routers to act as a packet filtering firewall through the use of ACLs or access control lists. So, do we have any questions so far? Okay. So, I have a general comment here, Andrew. Okay. That, uh, you know, hubs are stupid and they just act as a repeater. Okay. So I'm going to need to repeat that just because those out here aren't going to be able to hear you. So Ben's comment is that hubs are stupid and another term for them is a repeater, correct? That's right. And then uh, the switches operate at layer two and talk from Mac to Mac. Okay. And that switches operate at layer two and pass from Mac to Mac. That's right. And then routers operate at layer three and talk from IP address to IP address. And that routers operate at layer three and they talk from IP address to IP address. Shane is plugging in headphones so that <laughs> he can hear what you're saying without us playing some form of telephone. Oh, wow. Uh... I mean, I mean, look, look, actually, I should have just started repeating what you said, then no one would realize you're feeding answers because it was on the call and watching the recording. All right, so some general definitions here. Here, so. When you see a border router, you know, with that one, it's ref okay. It's the connection of a 100 base T network to a T1 network, or, you know, border router, it sits at the edge of your network, the edge of your private network, and what it does is it gives access to the open internet. You can set up a zone where you can use a router to segment a network into multiple networks. And if you're wanting to segment, segment a network, something I should have said last slide was switches. With switching is where you're able to see sub, subnetting set up through the use of something called a VLAN or virtual link, where you're able to set up logical categories on a switch to break up you know, a broader network into smaller, more manageable groups. So if you've seen one of the big pizza box switches, you know, in a network or wiring closet, you're able to configure subnets to where, you know, this, this set of the switch is configured for network access that the HR group needs. And another could be set up for management. Another one could be set up for production development. And another one could be set up for security. It allows you to break up the network into more manageable and logical groups for ease of management. And an access control list, it's self-explanatory. It's a list that is defined to determine what can pass through a network. So, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about that here in a few minutes. One of the things that you can see, you can do for remote management of a router, you can set it up using SNMP, which runs over what port? Yeah. 
Yep. I'm waiting to see if anyone else chimes in. Actually, no, that is that is wrong. That 25 is SMTP. SNMP, which runs over ports 161 and 162. You got it right on the money, Jeff. But but you know what? We'll give an opportunity for redemption. Um, we just mentioned Telnet. What what port does that run over? I don't, I don't. Trenton, you got it. In, in Kelsey, too. I received it just a second after. Telnet runs over port 23. So one of the things to bear in mind when you're doing any sort of remote management within a terminal environment is keeping in mind which protocols are encrypted and unencrypted. Is, you know, if you aren't encrypting that tunnel and what you're doing to remote in, Someone could set up and use Wireshark or run a man-in-the-middle attack and capture your administrative credentials to a device. So your unencrypted protocols, it's Telnet, and then SNMP versions 1 and 2. For encryption, you're going to use SSH or Secure Shell, and you're going to use SNMP version 3. And routers, they, they work by creating a something that is called a routing table that's able to specify routes and connections between networks. So just think of a routing table, it's same as if you were to pull up Google Maps and map from, you know, here at Cyber Protects, and let's say right after class, you're, just, you're hungry, you decide, hey, I need directions to get over to Cracker Barrel. You know, same, just as how Google Maps can give you directions on how to get there to Cracker Barrel, you know, routing tables, it specifies how you can get from your internal network, from the network you're housed. It shows you how to get from there out to Google.com or whatever website you want to use. So with routers, you're going to see three routing protocols that are mentioned. You have routing information protocol, which is RIP. You have BGP, or border gateway protocol. And then you have... One of the most common ones that I've seen and worked with is OSPF, or Open Shortest Path First. And the routes, they're configured either as static, where you have said, I want to hop from point A to point B to point C. Or they're dynamic, where, okay, I can hop from A straight to C, straight to G, and so on. Or it's automated. Now we have, we have a fun little, little thing here, a proxy. Now a proxy is very simply just an intermediary device. It's, you know, as we've put here, you know, that for the clients on that graph, let me, let me see if I can get this little tablet here to work. So for the clients that we've got right here, before they go out to the open internet, you know, they're going to shoot right up there, and they're going to come into a proxy server. And then the proxy is going to filter that traffic before sending them through the firewall to the internet. So they're using that proxy as an intermediary and really in a practical sense, I think of it as a bit of a buffer between that device and the open internet. So a proxy needs to be able to, you know, first off, it's not going to do you any good if it's not able to block malicious sites. You know, you're, you're setting the proxy up to be able to protect you in that device. If it's not able to filter out malicious content, it's not doing anything good for you. And it needs to be able to cache data to where you know, let's say you go to Wikipedia time and you go to a single page that, you know, first time it takes a bit to load, but it's able to cache data so that on subsequent visits it loads quicker and quicker. When you have a combination of proxy and caching functions, it's referred to as a web security gateway. And a proxy, it operates at layer seven of the OSI model, 
or the application layer. All right, let's see if it'll let me. And you've got a couple different types of proxy here. You have a forward proxy where you're using it to mask and hide the ID of the requesting system. So you're hiding who you are on the open internet. You have a caching proxy where you're just storing data locally to prevent the time it takes for you to load a web page. You have content filtering where it evaluates and decides whether the website you're going to is allowed to be visited on that network. You have a reverse proxy where it's analyzing data that's coming into the network and it's doing that to perform analytics and filtering. And then you have an open proxy, which typically it's used to circumvent, you know, security posturing or you know, whatever's in place, it's typically third party. So I, I can recall, and I don't know if anyone else here was a part of either Huntsville or Madison City Schools when they first started adding laptops into the learning environment. So for me, when Huntsville City Schools first issued laptops, I was in seventh grade. And I remember because it seemed like IT would always play, was, they were playing a whack-a-mole to prevent kids from playing games in class. And, you know, I remember it, first day we got on the network, there wasn't anything set up. So, you know, back then it was cool to go to cool math games and, you know, and goof around during class. Well, eventually they set up and they're like, okay, we need to be restricting web traffic. So they put up, you know, and they set up some content filter. So first thing, me and some of my peers, I remember discussion. It seemed like every week we were finding a different way to circumvent their filter. And the last thing I remember was we would start using open proxies. So we would go to Google, and in hindsight, we were using some rather shady, shady proxy software. But we would use that to try to circumvent the group policy and content filtering that the school had set up so that we could play games during class. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell this part of the story and then we'll move on. But, you know, for me, I actually remember me and a couple of my buddies, we were the problem kids that the IT person at Challenger Middle School had to keep worrying about. And I remember the last time in the school year, she, me and some of the others got pulled into her office with the principal. I remembered her looking at me and going, Andrew, she's like, life would be so much easier if you were helping me lock this down instead of finding ways to jump through. And that encouraged me at that point, Cyber Patriot had just started up in the local school districts. And it's like, when you go to Grissom, you should probably consider looking at IT and look at, looking at you know, competing in Cyber Patriot. <laughs> so it was all because middle school Andrew wanted to circumvent and play cool math games and play Halo with his friends during class that I ended up where I am here. So thank you for indulging a slightly cringy story. Yep. Oh, I'm, I'm, well, Ben has kids in the school system. I'm pretty certain that's th that type of stuff is still occurring. Their students are at least trying. So, a key part of any network infrastructure that's being set up and designed, it's setting up a load balancer. And with that, it's very simply, it's a device that's able to redirect traffic, you know, to prevent overutilization of a resource. So it, it's, you know, most practical way I think about it, it's, you know, I don't know if any of you guys, as a kid, you know, whenever, you know, mom or whoever would come home from the grocery store, and there would be a ton of bags and mom would, and one of the parents would holler and just go, Hey, come out here, help, help bring this in. You know, they're, they're calling going, Hey, we need to bring in some additional help here so that I can, this can all physically get in the door and not overexert. 
a load balancer does the same. So a load balancer is traffic's going across the network. The load balancer is going to go, okay, I need some help handling this traffic. I'm going to redirect some traffic away from web server one. I'm going to send it to web server two. And it's going to make decisions based on, hey, I need some help managing this. Let's, let's begin to redirect some here. I'm sorry, Shane. And that, that is network address translation. So that's converting private IP addresses to publicly routable IPs. And with load balancing, you can you know, implement it as a physical hardware device, or you can set up a virtual appliance. And most commonly, it's associated with a router, a firewall, or you know, a NAT appliance. You can buy a physical load balancer, or you can set it up, you know, as software or as, you know, a virtualized piece of hardware. Yeah. So, and oftentimes the load balancer to check if something's alive and well, it's going to send a health check request. So, and of course, the, this, you know, I wasn't even paying attention to what was coming up next on deck, but. Yeah, NAT is essentially a proxy because IPv4 is incredibly limited. And it's NAT was designed to keep us from having to get rid of IPv4. And it dramatically reduces the number of outward facing IPs. So, next up here, we've got a remote access systems. So it's some examples we've got here. It's remote routing and remote access services. And it's going to run over multiple protocols. You know, you're going to see if you're in a dial-up environment, which I, I honestly, you know, I have only seen, seen dial-up in old TV shows and movies. I've never had to deal with that. Like, I'm pretty certain that was dead by the time I was born, but I'm not entirely sure. You have VPNs or virtual private networks. You have um, ISDN or integrated services digital line or, you know, DSL. Or, you know, you have the good old faithful cable modem. Now, now this is, this is a fun, fun term to throw out here. Unified threat management. That is a fun word to throw out. So what, what a UTM does is it consolidates security functions under one management resources. So, you know, it's going to take management of a firewall, an IDS or an IPS, an antivirus, a VPN, and other functions and it's going to put them under one consolidated system that you're able to manage. So it's rather than having to go and set up your Windows firewall and making sure you've got an IDS running and going into all those different programs, it's you log in, authenticate to one program, and you're able to manage all of those resources. And then we have the good old faithful firewall here where a firewall, it provides network isolation and protection. So it, it's quite literally sitting there standing guard between a host or a network. And you, know, you can set up a hardware firewall, you can convert a router to, to function as a packet filtering firewall. You can implement it in firmware, or you know, a common thing is to set it up as software. So. You know, most common one that people are familiar with is your Windows firewall, but, you know, I've played around a bit before for one of my classes we played around with, I think it was TinyWall, which was an open source solution. So firewalls are allowed to, are able to allow people to come in or they can limit traffic. It, it's, you know, I, I think of the classic fantasy movie Lord of the Rings with, with Gandalf as they're going on their quest. 
And they get over this chasm and Gandalf looks back at this giant demon and he's like, you shall not pass. And then puts the staff down and then him and this demon go falling down. Yeah. Come on, no, no one else in here a Lord of the Rings fan? Okay, ben, Ben's with me. And, and of course, Shane's with me. I, I, I shouldn't. You you were brave enough to get to to include yourself, so I should probably say that. You you just threw a question at me. I was not prepared for. Um, ben, stateless versus stateful, because I know I constantly get those split. While Ben's putting that. <laughs> so you're the source of the echo. Okay. What what was the question, Andrew? The question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, difference between stateless and stateful. Yeah, so in the terms of, of firewalls, I'm, I'm assuming, um, there's one that actually keeps the, um, the status of where it is. So that would be the, the state full. Um, typically, we see uh, state full protocols would be anything dealing with uh, uh, inspection as they go through the firewall, whereas state list would just at a very high level um, not inspect much. Uh, there you go. That's a good. <laughs> there you go. Yes. So if I would, I need to reorient my screen over here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Shane, I think the slide answers your question. I mean, so, so Shane, j just just take a screenshot of the slide, <laughs> or we'll send them out here in a bit here after class. So, okay. So let me go back to if there's anything else I need to address on. Previous slide. So, you know, they allow a minute, they stand at the edge of the network. You know, you're able to proxy traffic using it. You're able to inspect packets that are coming in. You know, you're able to configure a firewall for NAT, which is converting a private IP address into a public IP. And you're able to configure access control lists where you get to determine who to, to use another pop culture reference that's a little, little relevant today, you get to determine who is in the room where it happened. Is that, is that lost on, on everyone in here? Has no one here seen Hamilton? <laughs> so, well, it, it's funny because among my friends, I'm out of the loop. <laughs> On okay. I mean, okay. So, so, uh, need need to write that down on the failed reference list. <laughs> so, with firewalls, you you need to apply the principle of least access, where you're able to prevent as much traffic while allowing unauthorized access. So. Similar to the concept of least privilege, where you're giving someone sort of the bare minimum they need to do their job. Just before. Just before. Yeah. If it explodes, well, that, that's a compliance issue, right? <laughs> blame, blame the government. Don't take responsibility for it. 
that's a bad joke to make. Um, so network-based firewalls, they filter at layer four of the OSI model, and you know, they can operate at layer three. And you know, with stateless firewalls, they're you know, biggest thing with stateless, it's not aware of, of traffic patterns. It has a simple rule set, you know, and each packet is individually expected. Stateful has a full picture. It monitors from end to end. And with it, it's able to, you know, tell you what state a session's in, and it's able to, you know, keep a better eye on it. You know, it, it's, whereas stateless has some simple rule sets, you know, with stateful, it seems that everything, everything can be a lot. And stateful is a whole lot faster under heavy loads. So with firewall configuration, you have some fun things with a rule set. You know, one of the, the common ones you'll see is block by default, which that one, it, it explicitly allows own, it'll, it'll explicitly allow only specific traffic to known series or to known services. And it's typically the last rule in an access control list, list with an implicit deny. Meaning, if it's not listed above it, don't let it in. You know, you can allow specific traffic where, based on the pr principle of least privilege, where you have specific rules at the top, and you have some limited scenarios where an any is permitted. You know, with an access control list, you're, you're going to list a source IP, you're going to have a destination IP, and you're going to have a port number. And with that, it's going to read top to bottom. You know, and then you're going to need to specify the destination port. And it should correspond to the service that needs to be accessed. So if we're using HTTPS, what port would need to be punched open? 443. So if you're specifying specific ports, you don't need to put in any value. Because if you do, that's just saying, hey, I don't care where you're coming from. We'll just let you right on it. And the biggest thing there is you want to avoid using too wide of a range of ports. So, so Shane, j just to help you out here, we have another slide with some stateful firewalls. So with this one, it's quite literally... It's breaking down. So this is the pack. Not mean to go forward. I'm trying out this tablet, so so bear with me. So you've got the packet here, and what it's doing is as it comes here over to the firewall, the firewall is examining, you know, the data and the contents with it. In the stateful firewall, it's going to examine each packet as it comes. So it's going to be a whole lot slower than a stateless firewall. That, but that's enough time doodling for me. So, and I believe we, we've talked about, or at least it's been mentioned before, an IDS and an IPS. So an IDS, or intrusion detection system, it's configured to detect misconfigurations or unauthorized access into a system. You know, it's inline monitoring results, you know, from an IDS, that's gonna be where you're gonna position that where all traffic has to pass through. So biggest keyword to know with an IDS is that it's detecting. It's detecting something's gone wrong and it's sending up a red flag and or an alarm not able to do anything to mitigate it. You know, and it can be based on, you know, set up to be identified based on signature based, where it's looking for a pattern based on a static signature. You have anomaly based, where you build a baseline of acceptable behavior, and you train a system with data to establish a baseline. And you use that established profile based on real data to flag deviations. So an example I can think of that, how many of you guys have 
you know, been traveling. You've gone out of state or, you know, you've gone somewhere you wouldn't normally go. You go to use your debit or credit card and you insert the chip or you swipe it and it declines. And then you get a text from your bank going, hey, we've noticed some unusual activity on your card. That, that's a perfect example I can think of with anomaly based. And you have behavior based, which is you're, you're, you're setting up a baseline, but you're looking for evidence of a compromise by observing and reporting. And then you have heuristics based, which is where you're using an algorithm with artificial intelligence and machine learning. You know, if a detection, if it's followed by steps to mitigate or modify that environment, it's at that point, it's considered an IPS or intrusion prevention system. So when it comes to these two devices, you know, in activity, it's, it's a data source that's of interest to the operator. You know, your administrator, it's self-explanatory. It's the person that's responsible for making sure that device is running and administering on the device. You know, an alert, it's a message from that IDS or IPS saying that something's gone wrong. Or, you know, as I, as I think of it most often, it's the, oh crap, something's gone wrong in Haywire here. And an event is very simply, it's an occurrence in a data source that indicates that something's occurred. You know, the two types of IDS and IPS you're going to see, you have passive, where it's going to be logging, it's going to notify, and then it's going to ignore it. And then you have active, where it's going to terminate a process, it's going to change the network, and it's a little deceptive. So, you know what, hey, hey Ben? Yeah. I'm thinking we've been at it. We're looking at time at 7.13. So what do we say we give them a brief break? You know, get up, stretch your legs, and... That's fine. Okay. You're running so, the show, buddy. All right. Well, time is 7.14, so we're going to take a quick, quick four or five-minute break. Let's go five minutes. Come on back at 7.19, and we'll jump right in.
Well, with that, I encourage you to actually compare it with what you've got in your notes. Oh, I got it. Yeah. So that way you can make a note on your sheet, what you've got and got wrong. And I'll be honest, I was making notes as I was writing them. No, no, I was talking about the homework. Oh, homework? I think we should have an answer key for it. <laughs> So I, I, I'm realizing that I'm, I'm throwing kind of more, I'm, I don't want to say I'm being a little more abusive with the ports tonight, but, you know, I will apologize if you want I mean, Yep. And I'll, I'll explain that here in a moment. And you know, we need a practical exercise. Something to, you know, try, try to not fill you guys with PowerPoint tonight. So I'll walk through that here in a moment. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I was going to say, th this exercise, ladies and gents, is we're going to be a little easier. I'm not throwing you a mixture of what each protocol is. I'm not mixing it up, but let me go ahead and share screen. So one of the things we just talked about with firewalls is setting up access control lists to making sure that a network is secure, that what's coming through the firewall is traffic that we want to allow and want to actually have come in. So you've got here, we have port number 20 and 21. So I want to ask you guys, what's the protocol name? So message it to me. And you know, once you guys give me port 20, let me go and I'll put this in chat. So for this exercise, I want you guys to identify, tell me what's running over port 20 and 21. What's the protocol name? What does it do? Now, you don't have to give me some in-depth technical analysis, but try to give me high profile what it does, whether it's using TCP or UDP, and whether it should be blocked on that network or not. So. So for those of you guys here in person, what what operates on port 20 and 21? FTP. What does it do? Yep. 
It allows you to, to send and transmit files. So is it using TCP or UDP? TCP. Why should it be blocked? So you guys are all saying block, block FTP. Okay. Okay. That's a good question. So internally, I, I would see no problem in allowing FTP to be run. Now, if you're going across the open internet with FTP, I would, I'd be a little more like, eh, let, let's not. Um, my general rule of thumb is if you don't have a genuine use for it, block it. Now, now that is the Andrew State and cheap and cheap technical analysis. So, what what operates on port fifty three? DNS. What does it do? So DNS, it maps an IP address to a domain. So instead of going, you know, putting in, let's say, hypothetically, Google's using 19326 or 248. Blah, blah. It allows you to instead put, well, hey, I want to go to google.com, type that into your browser, and it sends you there. Is it using TCP or UDP? TCP? Should it be blocked? Exactly. So you don't want to block DNS on a network. You need it to be able to go. Well, you don't need it. If you have DNS disabled, you can, you know, you can find the IP address of a website <laughs> other ways, but it's a pain in the neck. And if DNS is out, you're going to hear about it. Okay. What's on port 80? Okay. What does HTTP do? It allows you to pull web elements. Is it using TCP or UDP? TCP. Should it be bought? So, I, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm, so, you unless you have an, a specific reason to be using HTTP, it it should be blocked because you have no security provided over it. HTTP is genuinely unsecure, which is compared to HTTPS, which runs over what port? where it allows you to pull web elements and web pages securely. And what, what is it? Is it using TCP or UDP? TCP. And I would not block that one. You, so, have you ever noticed when using your web browser, that you have a little lock right, right beside the web address. If that lock is green and it's, you know, clicked in, it's using HTTPS. Typically, if you're using HTTP, your browser is going to warn you, it's going to trigger something, it's going to go, hey, don't go here. Now, now this is a tougher one here. What, what is 636? LDAP over TLS. So, Kincaid, I, I hadn't heard from you in chat, so I'm not going to force you to come out on the call, but... Am I supposed to be putting things in chat? I mean, I, I, you, can, you can participate in chat. I might then. 
Okay. Put some snarky comments in there for you. Uh, you wanted this you just know, for everyone. You know, you know what, Kincaid? Uh, what, what does all apps do? Good question. I do not remember. I don't even remember what it stands for. Okay. What is That's all I got. Do? It accesses directories. You know what? I'll take that. I'll take that. So LDAP's using TLS. So LDAP's, it's LDAP over TLS. So, so what what would you infer with it compared to LDAP? It's more secure. So, would you allow access to LDAPs, or would you block it? Okay, Kelsey, I would concur. LDAPs, it's short for LDAP over TLS. It allows you to be able to securely, I want to say secure, you can use it to authenticate to a directory securely. I mean, look, it's all good. So port 110, what does that do? It's used for pop. So, so what does pop do? You use it for email. Don't block it. Good, you're catching up. What about port 25? The mall. Are you saying male or mall? Because I'm confused. SMTP. What is SMTP used for? Mail. Email. So you're going to say you should allow it, correct? I mean, you need to receive email. Now, now, ne next up here on our list, it's you have ports 137, 138, 139. What what is that? <laughs> Let's see if anyone takes a stab in chat. I am receiving your messages, Josh. I'm not going to say that out loud. So, I was going to say, I think you guys get the point. So, when it comes to designing a network architecture and particularly setting up a firewall, you need to think through, you know, because one of the things you might see is it's going to say, you know, for a potential drag and drop or practical exercise on the test, it's going to say, hey, we need to use HTTPS. And then for the drop down, it's not going to tell you HTTPS. It's going to give you, you know, port 80, 443, you know, 22, you know, or 119 or some other combination. So, we don't just drill these ports to be, you know, annoying at the start of class. It's if you know these ports, it's going to make your life a whole lot easier on in the exam. So.
I'm honestly not sure off the top of my head. So, got through that. So let me share the screen and we'll keep trucking along. So with an IDS and IPS, there are two places that you can set it. You can set it, you know, you can actually configure it to be on the host to where it's on a Windows desktop or, or whatever machines you're running in that environment or that you're hosting it on the network. So we have a little graph here on screen. Oh. So in this network system, the IDS for network base, you know, just to help you visualize that on the chart, you know, your hosts are right here and the IDS is positioned to keep tabs on what's coming in and out of that network. And it's positioned in between those host devices and the open internet. Whereas with a host based, it's your IDS, it's functioning there on those host machines to where data can come in and out of that network, but it's not going to get, potentially it's not going to get filtered or it's not going to run through that IES till it comes to the host machine. So, you know, with a host based IDS, you're typically going to see an integrity check where it's going to check and go, okay, is the machine functioning? Is CPUs not running too crazy? You know, you don't have a ton of programs that are overloading memory that's allocated. You know, whereas a network IDS, it's going to check and keep an eye on what comes in and out of that network and it's going to try to identify any misconfigurations and potentially any mischievous or unauthorized network access so moving next um next fun little thing you've got a vpn where it's establishing a secure connection with resources over an unsecure network so, for instance, you, you're seeing VPNs being used a ton nowadays as, you know, in light with the COVID pandemic. People are running through or using a VPN to access their company resources from the comfort of their home. And it can be configured using a VPN appliance or software solutions. And you can use a VPN to connect LAN to LAN. So... Easiest way I can think of is that, you know, I, I really think of it, it's a tunnel through a mountain. You know, if you're, if you're trying to go across from, you know, let's say I'm going from my home in cyber, uh, my home in South Huntsville, and I'm needing to access a machine here at Cyber Protect. Well, you know, here in Huntsville, you know, just on roads, I would have to navigate normally. I would have to come down Memorial Parkway, get off at I-565, come down I-565 and either you know, get off down at Madison Boulevard or take 565 loop back up there at County. You know, well, a VPN would effectively be me being able to just avoid all of those roads and come driving a straight line from my home over here, regardless of what's occurring outside, whatever roads or buildings may exist. So it, it's sort of a direct line in. And some common protocols that are used by VPNs, you've got IPSec, you have layer two tunneling protocol and point to point troubling protocol. And you have a hardware device that's called a VPN concentrator where it, it creates those remote access VPNs and it creates that encrypted tunnel session between hosts. You know, with Cisco and Cisco devices, you're able to use scalable encryption that you're able to implement more and more of those tunnels as you require more access.
So let me readjust because I've accidentally closed out the chat. Pull that over there. So here we have a graph. You have two VPNs, one with a split tunnel and one without. So without the split tunnel, this host, you know, let's call him Jim. Jim here, you know, for him to access anything, you know, when he wants to go out here to the internet, so let's say he's wanting to go to google.com, with this VPN, he's having to jump there and then jump to his company network. And then from that, his company network, he's then having to get out to the internet. Which, it's a little slow. You know, it's an additional hop. Whereas if a split tunnel from Jim here is able to go, you know, use his VPN, He's able to go straight into his company's network. And when he's not accessing anything on his company network, you know, he's able just to connect normally as he would without it. <laughs> yeah. It, it's really using with a split tunnel, it, it's sort of filtering going, hey, this is relevant to my work environment. I'm going to go here. Hey, this isn't relevant to work. I'm This employee is logging in on their computer to go to Facebook and look at whatever cat pictures or whatever's on there. I'm not going to throw them through the company resource. I'm just going to send them on their way. It's, um, you know, looking at this, for me, what immediately comes to mind is whenever you set up an MDM or mobile device management tool, such as you know Microsoft Intune, that you're able to set your work assets and data within its own little box on your phone. To where when you're in that box, you're able to access company resources such as Outlook, Teams, whatever's gonna be there. But outside of that container, you have your personal data. So you have your pictures, you'll have Instagram, Facebook, and whatever social networks you have, and you have your personal data outside of that box. And it's the same sort of principle with that split tunnel. It's able to differentiate what needs to go away. So, I mean, we, we covered that. <laughs> now, here with tunneling, you, you've got some keywords here that I'm going to encourage you to jot down. So with point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, with that one, it's going to encapsulate and encrypt. That slide conflicts itself. And that's on me. But, you know, so with point-to-point, -point, it's going to encapsulate and encrypt. And if you're running, I think, it's, is it PPP? that it's unencrypted then? Yeah, PPP. Okay. So when you're using PPP, it's unencrypted. It becomes a secure and encrypted protocol when you're using point to point. And for that one, the point that operates off of is port 1723. To my knowledge, you don't need to know that for the test. And then you have L2F or layer two forward. It's Cisco proprietary. It's creating a tunnel for dial up. What, whatever that old technology is. But all joking aside, dial up, you're going to see that used with phone lines. So with L2F, you know, it supports some authentication, but it's unencrypted. And with that one, it's using TCP port 1701. You don't need to. I'm just saying it because it's. And you know, <laughs> it's also decent knowledge to have. I mean, it's decent knowledge to have. I shouldn't say that it won't turn up on the test because I, if I say that, someone on the call is going to come back and be like, "I saw that on the test." 
And then you have L2 TP, which is layer two tunneling protocol. And that one, it's a collaboration with Microsoft and Cisco. And it's a combination of the two protocols we mentioned prior. You know, and with that one, it supports multiple different protocols such as IPX, SNA, and of course, IP. And a drawback of it is that it's unencrypted. And it uses UDP port 1701. You know, another tunneling protocol that we've talked about before is SSH, which runs over what port? That's, um, it's a soft toss. So before, before I jump into this slide, I um, see a question in the chat that I, I missed. So I apologize, Kincaid, and he asks, with a split tunnel, would it still reroute the traffic to the obscure location? So, to my knowledge, with the split tunnel, you're able to configure to where, you know, if I'm needing to access an email server through a VPN, you know, from home, it's going to route the traffic for that relevant resource through the VPN tunnel. If I'm needing to go to, you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, it's not going to send that traffic through the VPN tunnel to my network. It's just going to send it on its merry way as it would normally progress through the network. So it wouldn't reroute it to that obscure location as you put it. <laughs> yeah, it's able through, and I, I believe you can configure this using an access control list or you know, spec by specifying what things need to be routed through that VPN, it's able to make that decision there. So, another common tunneling protocol, as we just mentioned, is SSH, which is a secure shell connection between endpoints. And you can use SSH as a tunnel for other unencrypted protocols. Now we have IP set, which unlike the previous examples, it's not a tunneling protocol and it's used both within dial up and land to land configurations. Now IP second provides authentication headers and an encapsulating security payment. Now, what, what does that mean? Because I, I'm anticipating a question. Well, the good news is exactly. So. <laughs> That is a good question. I don't have an answer for that. I, I, I honestly don't know. So, Ben, is there a particular type of encryption algorithm that tunneling protocols will use? So, all right, I'm going to make a note of that. Shane, if you would email me that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, I imagine that can be configured and you can specify what encryption as for what those would, would entail and all the nitty gritty of that. I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So th this is where I I'll just be honest. I don't know. That's a little more in depth than what you need for the test. So, um, but that that's a fantastic question. I shouldn't have given you grief for anticipating. So, with IP sec, it's a set of protocols that's been developed for secure network communication utilizing cryptography. It doesn't specify what cryptography, but it uses it. Uh, so, with an authentication header, that's going to provide authentication and integrity. You know, it's going to make sure that 
it's coming from who it says it's coming from and that the data hasn't been changed. And then the ESP or encapsulating security payload, it's going to provide data encryption, or confidentiality, and it's going to provide some integrity. So with IPsec, there are three key services. It has data verification where it, you know, as it's self-explanatory, it verifies what data has been sent. It's going to provide non-repudiation. It's going to protect data from being tampered with. It's going to allow for private transactions. So it has two modes here. You have tunnel mode where the entire packet is protected with the headers and payload in transport where only the payload or data is protected. Now, now I realize that's confusing, but we have, again, planned and prepared for questions. So, you know, here with the authentication header, it lays out that, you know, here, you know, when it's in transport mode, you're going to get this entire Here. Oh, it finally lets me change my color. So here with this, it's going to, you know, it, it's going to capture in transport mode with it. It's going to encapsulate and encrypt or the authentication. It's going to authenticate all that's there present. When it's in tunnel mode, it's going to add a new IP header. Where you're in encapsulating in its, you know, where it's encrypting in providing some confidentiality and integrity to what's being sent, you know, you're only going to be worrying about these areas in transport, where you're only getting part of the packet that's being encrypted. But if you go to tunnel mode, you've got the whole darn thing. So another device that you're going to configure within a enterprise environment for security, you're going to set up a mail gateway. And that's a service that's designed to prevent the transmission of emails that either violate acceptable policy, you know, but they just have good old fashioned malware loaded to it, or, you know, they transfer information with malicious tech. Well, what does that mean? So a mail gateway, it's going to detect spam. You know, it, it's going to be used to try to help catch undesired messages that, you know, are sent through a variety of means. So that could be, you know, dealing with email, trying to prevent phishing or whaling or any of those different social engineering attacks. Using text where it's going to be, um, I want to say spimming is the key, is the attack type. Where it, it's social engineering and phishing, but it's using instant message. Um, Look, I'm surprised I remembered that one. Uh, you know, and, and to prevent spam, there have been multiple techniques that have been. So a common one, it's using a, do a domain blacklist and whitelist to where you're only allowing emails internally from users within your domain and allowing certain emails from other domains and other customers and clients you're using good old fashioned DNS lookup where you're seeing if that domain, it's something reputable. It's not from a shell company that just got formed all of you know, two minutes ago. You know, you can set it up using rule based where you go, Hey, if this, if this email mentions the word, I, I don't know, um, whistle or something, something like that. And, and that's being oversimplified, but you're, you're setting up that it has to pass a set of rules to be allowed in. You know, and, and these other ones. Now, you don't have to get that deep into mail gateways for this exam. And then, of course, we've got a web application firewall. And with that one, it's going to be conducting content filtering of traffic going over HTTP and HTTPS or ports 80 and 443. You can use it to filter out critical data and to prevent data from going outside the boundaries of the organization. So you would use a web application firewall would be employed if you're ordering something from Amazon and your data going into Amazon is going to 
filter out, you know, your credit card number, hopefully, you know, and it's going to prevent that data with your credit card number from being sent outside the boundaries of that network. You know, it provides flexibility by being able to block or allow similar content on the same resource. And one of the key functions of it is to decrypt SSL enabled traffic or secure socket layer traffic prior to being transferred in an internal network, allowing for proper filtering and analysis. So it's going to decrypt traffic that's coming in over HTTPS. It's going to decrypt it when it comes in to be able to make sure that. There's nothing tricky hidden in that data. And we've got a handy dandy little chart here. So it's you come into the network firewall and it's going to bounce data before it gets anywhere close. But that web application firewall, it's your line of defense before you come to your server to determine whether or not you can access that web resource. And, and what they do is these, and you have web security gateways that, you know, they sit in between, they simply sit after an internet firewall, and they're a mechanism that's set up that combines network proxying and content filtering in one application. So some of the things with using a web, web security gateway, some of the benefits you have is you have real-time traffic analysis. Data is being analyzed as it's coming to the door of that network. It's going to inspect the contents of that of, of each packet that's coming in. You know, it's going to keep an eye on what resources are being used within a web server or web environment. And it's going to be looking to detect any data exfiltration or anything that's getting outside of the bound. So we have another fun one here. We have DEP, or Data Execution Prevention, where the biggest goal of it is to prevent damage from occurring to your computer or viruses and other threats. It's going to monitor programs for use of the system memory, and very simply, it's going to have a no execute. So open in Intel, you're going to have the XD bit, where it has, you know, very simply, it's a switch that goes execute disable. With AMD, you're going to have enhanced virus protection. And another thing that comes in here is data loss prevention, which are those are tools and processes that are used to ensure that sensitive data data is not lost, misused, or accessed by unauthorized users. And it's going to monitor and control endpoints. It's going to monitor the activities and filter data streams. That would make sense. So have you ever noticed that I would imagine if you're using like XD bit within an Intel environment, you notice that anytime you update for Windows, that if you're updating drivers or after you've reloaded an OS for the first time, you're going to have updates to your graphics drivers or to your processor. So I would imagine that that no execute, those features, that those are being updated as you continue to update the function of those devices. You know, similar to how if you're running out of the box, you're running Windows Defender, that every time Microsoft releases a new patch or update, they're also patching Windows Defender. So we've got a little chart here with you know some protocols that transmit and clear text and the encrypted the encrypted replacement for those protocols. And we've talked about a ton of these. And now now one thing that has been adjusted within the CompTIA between from the 501 to the 601. So I don't recall for the 501, it listing in the objectives, DNS secure as a you know, answer. I don't recall seeing that in any of the practice tests or anything that I took to prepare for the exam. But one of the things of this domain, I'd encourage you 
So when we send the slides out to make a note of these things, is that CompTIA is listing, and as part of this domain, if you go and take the 601 exam, they're wanting you to know that you understand which protocols to use for security and which ones don't. So I would encourage you guys to take a picture or, like I said, we'll send out the slides later tonight and make a note of these. Just because I, I would take a guess that you are going to see one of these based on just how CompTIA is structured the exam and how they've consolidated the domains, you're going to see something with these. So you've got a thing called a protocol analyze. And it's used to really take inventory and evaluate what a protocol does on a network. You know, you some other terms for it, you've got a network analyzer, a packet sniffer, or just a good old sniffer. You know, in order to work effectively, it has to have access to a switch that allows for port mirroring and it allows for switch port analyzer. When used correctly, protocol analyzers can be used to collect traffic for future analysis. It can help you collect evidence for incident response. And if used improperly, you know, you can use a software such as Wireshark, and if you run that on a network and someone's transmitting data, you know, let's say they aren't using HTTPS and they're logging into a vendor or a web a shop that allows them to buy something off their credit card, and they transmit their credit card data using a website that's using port 80. Well, if you're using Wireshark and you're on that network, you can capture that packet and you can get their credit card information. And then you can go buy yourself a brand new, what, I believe you have a new Xbox that's coming out soon, right? I mean, you know, you, you can go have a all for one and have a fun day. So, and typically network interface cards, you've got two modes of operation. You have Promiscuous mode and non promiscuous mode. So, go ahead. Does, does anyone have any questions? I want to take a moment to check chat. I haven't seen anything. So, another some other things that you will see on the test, and I recall seeing these within a you know, one of the hands-on lab questions they ask is what commands you would use for troubleshooting? So, these, these commands are useful to have, and we'll walk through what they do. So, ARP, or Address Resolution Protocol, it's used to identify what devices exist. So, if you're on a switch network, you need to send out an ARP request if you're going to send data on that network. So, for instance, you know, an ARP would be me going, hey, Trenton, you still awake? And Trenton would nod his head, shake, or go, yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Actually, yep, that's correct. So that first one swapped. Um, but with that one, you're going to view the ARP table. Whenever you send out an ARP broadcast, you're trying to identify what hosts exist on that network. With IP config or IF config within a Linux world, and IF config does work on a Mac. You know, with that one, you're going to view the network configuration for that system. So you're going to identify your IP address, your subnet mask, and your default gateway. And if you're running, you know, like on my machine, I'm running on my personal computer, I have VMware and I have a couple virtual network adapters. If I run IP config, well, I've got one of those addresses running. That's going to show up within that command. You have Netcat, which is the Swiss Army knife of pen testing. You can use it to send or receive information. And then a common one that I recommend for any, I use it a ton whenever I'm 
running a port scan to try to see if I can map something in conjunction. But the next step is going to identify all TCP and UDP connections that are open. You have Nmap and Zenmap, which use those to scan a network, identify hosts that are alive and open ports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have, if you're in a Linux environment, you're going to use dig, but in Windows, you're going to use NS lookup. And with that, you're resolving a host name to an IP. And then, of course, we have the common ping command and, you know, rest in peace, Sean Connery. But you had in the hunt for Red October, as they were hunting, they identified a machine. You know, you had a line of send them one ping. And I don't do accents real good, so I apologize. But ping is what you use to identify network configure or network connectivity, make sure that something's alive. Other one you've got, it's T you have TCP dumb which is, you know, it's an advanced command that you use to inspect traffic, that you're allowed to basically look at what's going on on different interfaces of the machine to get an idea of what's going on. You have trace route, where you're looking at the number of hops to a destination. Within the Linux world, you have VN stat, where you monitor network traffic from the console. And then you have who is, where you're looking up a domain. <laughs> So let me go ahead and come here and stop sharing that screen. What we'll do is we're gonna we're gonna walk through because each of these commands is something you need to do. What just happened? Okay. I got a weird funky error over here and I was like, what's going on? But we are all good. So how many of you guys have used, have ever played around with the command prompt? Okay. It's all you used to have. So go ahead and we're gonna, we're going to share that screen. And I, I'm going to ask you guys, if you can, to walk through with me, just so, just so that way you guys get some hands-on and you can see with your own eyes what each of these commands does. So the first thing I want you guys to do... No, Trent. What we're going to do is I want you guys, and I'll put this in chat, I want you guys to pull up command prompt and I'll go ahead and demo that. Within the Windows world, you're going to hit the Windows key and R. And then I simply just type in CMD and hit enter. And that pops you out into the command prompt. So the ping command is what we use to verify connectivity. So I want to check that I'm connected to the internet. So I'm going to ping google.com. And with that, you can see that we've got that connection live. So on your machine, I encourage you guys, put that command in and, you know, you sh if you're connected to the WebEx, you should have connectivity to Google. If you don't, you probably have a bigger problem. So one of the things that'll help you sort of visualize how routers work. I'm gonna make sure I've got the command. Make sure it's not. So Kelsey, for you, I'm gonna put your command second for what you're gonna end up needing to type. And I hope this will work on the Mac. For those of you guys on Google or not, Google's not an operating system. Okay. For those of you guys on Windows, 
Why don't you guys type in that command into the command prompt? And then I believe the Linux command will work on Mac. So it'll take a few moments to populate. But what this will do is it's going to track each jump that you're doing from one router to a next to get to Google. For instance, if I can draw... I can annotate now. Yay. So that connection right there, that is from this machine going to the router we have here at CyberProtect. That's that. And then you have the next router, and it jumps from there to there. And then for some reason, there we go. It took a bit. So it took us three hops. I, this I can't write. Save my life. Took us three hops to get outside of Cyber Protector's network, and then right here, you know, we went to Knowledge or Wow. So we've gotten to our ISP's network, and then we've jumped outside of that ISP's connection, and now we're jumping through servers to get to Google. So I'll remove the annotations, but for me, us here, it took 16 hours. I mean, John, I, I will say I wasn't wrong, but that wasn't what I meant to have come out. So, and then, you know, we'll show this command and then we'll, head into a practical exercise. So if you type IP config, it's going to allow you to see the specific IP address of your device. So the IPv4 address of this device, it's 192.168.1.131. We're running a slash 24 subnet mask or 255.255.255. And the default gateway is dot one. Now, some of you guys may seem like we've got on this machine, you might see an IPv6 address. Now, IPv6 is unique in that it assigns a publicly routable IP address using the hardware MAC address of your route, or not of your route, of your computer. So that each, that each laptop, desktop, whatever device has its own unique IPv6 address based on the MAC address of that device. So, I'm not, I'm not going to show in too much more of that, but that's just some basic commands. I encourage you guys to play around with command prompts, some of the commands that we talked about. Do we have any questions? The let me go back over to WebEx. Are you needing this one, Shane, or the following one? Okay, leave that up there for you for a minute. Let me, let me see if I've got an answer to this one. I do not.
So let me get back over here. So common attack that you're going to see is something called banner grabbing. And a banner, it's a text message that's received from probed hosts. So if you use a, you know, biggest thing I can think of is if you're working out on base and you're with NASA, or you're working on, the, on with the Army on a contract, you have a government-issued computer, you're going to see a banner on there, something that says this is a U.S. official property of the United States government. You have no expectation of privacy, and anything you set, you do on this machine will be collected and can be used against you in a court of law. Or some other disclaimer. So banner grabbing, it, it's you're really just trying to collect those banners to grab data concerning what's occurring on that network and services that are running on open ports. For an administrator, they can use banners to catalog assets, keep an idea of what a device is and not, you know, be sitting at a ton of MAC addresses. They're able to apply those to very much categorize, very logically determine what's going on. An intruder can use that to determine what attack vector they're going to use to attack. And we've got some commands there that if you wanted to play around with Nmap or Netcat and try out some banner grabbing, you can. So we've got a, a fun little chart here. And this is going to be a bit of a review of, in some ways, domain one. So what, what's a, a distributed denial of service attack? It's a denial of service attack with multiple attackers or people attempting to overwhelm that system. What's interesting is based off of, you know, a denial of service attack, you know, depending on what the attackers want to do. So if they want to deplete resources, well, they're going to look and they're going to go, okay, we, I want to exploit a specific protocol. You know, and there they're able to use a TCP or SYN attack, a TCP SYN attack or a push plus ACK attack. And, and a ton of these, you know, the TCP SYN and push ACK, I don't recall seeing, but they're good to do some research on. So under that umbrella of the distributed denial of service, you have a ton of different attack methods. So I actually want to show you guys something. Have any of you guys seen a cyber threat map before? He did? Yeah, fire eye? I mean, I mean, you know. I mean, God help us if that's what happened. That. So Ben showed you guys this, right? Okay. So threat maps like this function, you know, by being able to identify what's going on with a denial of service attack. So they're able to distinguish between, you know, what threat vector or exploit the attackers are using to generate this nice little chart. Not gonna lie, I'm kind of sad that I'm not, <laughs> I didn't know that before. So a ton of the places I know, like Symantec, they put out one. So the people that put out some of those resources are their companies. Yeah, their companies, and they're probably feeding intel from what they're seeing in the field or what they're getting reported on analytics. So, but for, for the purpose of, you know, this domain, one of the biggest things you guys will need to know is how to defend some countermeasures you have against DDoS attacks. Oh, right, that might help. So you guys should be able to see it on the WebEx. And 
you know, the biggest thing is so like if you want to mitigate and stop attacks, if you're under a DDoS attack, we talked about load balancing earlier, which what what is a load balancer do? It, it's into, it diverts traffic to keep itself from being overwhelmed. So if someone's DDoSing a specific web server, by using a load balancer, you're able to distribute some of that traffic to another server and to limit the impact. You're probably still going to have some slower access, but it's not going to completely take down that device. You know, you can set up throttling to where if a host sends, you know, X amount of traffic when X amount of time, they have to wait a certain amount of time before they can send again. So, you know, with that, I think specifically of like, if you watch a, a certain streams on Twitch or YouTube, streamers can set up that, hey, I don't want anyone putting a message in chat within a minute of each other or 30 seconds. And that's to prevent people from spamming and flooding the chat. Um, you know, deflection, which is where you're. You're hoping someone's going to attack a different target, and that's setting up a honeypot, which, do, do you guys remember what was the issue, the two legal issues with honeypots? Yes. And, you know, but by using a honey honeypot as a countermeasure against a DDoS attack, you know, you're able to see what's going on on that network in real time but you're also able to study what that adversary is doing and gain valuable threat intelligence in real time. You know, with a DDoS attack, looking at forensics afterwards is valuable, where you're looking at event logs, you're looking at packet tracing, you're looking at traffic patterns, and you're trying to deconstruct what happened. And a, va a key part of this domain is going to be being able to identify how you implement security and now, now again, CompTIA has just released this, so a ton of this is speculation, but based on the objectives, it wouldn't shock me if they were to throw in, you know, a something going, your, your company's been hit with a DDoS attack, for instance. How do you counter that? And how do you, after the attack, what steps do you take to remediate that? Or they could do that with a buffer overflow or any number of attacks and vulnerabilities. So, and now we come into some password cracking and some tools that we can use for, for fun here. So, you have Brutus, which is online play based, and I almost had, had, had the strongest urge to go at two right before reading that. Oh, come on, no one here read any Shakespeare? Thank you, Ben. Et tu, Brute? As, as Julius Caesar is assassinated by senators, he looks upon his friend Brutus and, and goes, Et tu, or you too, Brutus? And then he dies. And so begins the rest of the plot of Julius Caesar without the title character. So with Brutus, it's online-based, it's open source. You're able to resume and load. You know, those options allow you to pause an attack, and attack, but the biggest drawback is it's Windows-based. Either that or it's, you know, you have to be connected to the internet. I have not used Brutus a ton. So I'm not, I'm not able to speak anything about it. You have Rainbow Crack, where they're looking to crack the hash. And, and with that one, they're, you know, with that one, they're using what's called a rainbow table. So they have a ton of hashes that have already been cracked. And they're using that calculation to determine what to do. You have the Fuzz, or WFuzz, which is a web-based application. So I assume you might be able to go online and just run it in browser. But that one is going to brute force. It's just going to keep guessing that password till it gets it. Sort of like me in geometry in high school. 
that joke sounded better in my head. And, you know, biggest, and then of course that one, it'll locate some hidden resource files. Now, within the Windows world, if I'm going to be doing any password cracking, I tend to personally use, in any testing environment, I would use Kane Enable, just because it's a multitasking tool. With that one, you're able to use a dictionary attack. You're able to do some sniffing to try to discern it. You're able to brute force. You're able to do, launch a crypt analysis attack. You know, you're able to look at cached passwords on a system. You know, you're able to analyze specific routing protocols. It just does a ton more. And it's just, look, it's the same reason, you know, for me, I think of like, you know, what, what was the big advantage of a UTM or unified threat management? It consolidates everything into a single resource. With Kane Enable, you have a ton of password attacks and tools you can use there all within a single place. You have John the Ripper, not to be confused with the historic Jack. And now when it's multiple source and you can run it on Linux, on any Linux or Unix system, and you can, I'll see, you, you can run it. You can run it on Mac. You have THC Hydra, which is used to crack network passwords. And with that one, it, it supports multiple, multiple platforms. And you've got Medusa. Man, man, just saying that petrifies me a bit there. And, and it's a network password cracker. It's a command line tool, so you have to be working within a command prompt or terminal environment. And the efficiency of it depends on your connectivity to the network. And it supports parallel attacks or two attacks working in tandem. You know, for password cracking, you've got another rainbow-based tool. You've got off crack. You've got loft crack, which it's both of those two are Windows-based. Loft crack is an alternative, and it works with hashes. And then you have air crack, which is commonly used to crack Wi-Fi passwords, and it works with WEP and WPA. It's able to. It's effective against those two encryption types, and it works within a Linux and Windows environment. So, so, I would say cracking the hash would be more important. Because if you're able to crack the hash, you're able to figure out how it got to, it generated that value. But so think about it this way. If you're able to crack the password, you have access. The hash is generated through running. <coughs> yeah. You you can use theoretically, and I, and I believe I'm I'm getting this right, but you're able to use if you're able to crack the hash, you're able to use that hash value to get the password. At least that's how I've always thought of it. So, do we have any questions? I wanna. So, so biggest thing, and we're, we've talked about a ton of tools you can use to pass passwords. The weakest link for authentication you know, it's the username and password. You know, I, I was reading, I want to say I was reading something on LinkedIn, and it was an article that you had a, I, I want to say it was like an executive, a CIO, CFO, you know, one of your C-level management within an organization, their accounts were hacked, not because of anything that company failed to do for security, but because this C-suite executive kept using the same password and he had the same password for his work email and all his work credentials that he had for Facebook. And his Facebook password was cracked. And he had his email openly available on the company website. 
So this attacker, rather than trying to break through this organization's security, opted to, take a, to gamble on humans being creatures of habit. And lo and behold, he was able to get access to some resources. So, and I, and I think we've got a good stopping point for the evening. So, anyone here present have any questions? Anyone online in chat have any questions? All right. Well, if there aren't any questions, it's 8.27. I'm going to go and let you guys go for the evening. So.